Hello, my name is Mauricio Velasco. I am the director, writer, animator, artist, you know, a composer for Return of Zootopia. I essentially had to do everything except for, you know, the rest of the characters' voice acting. So creative multitasker, Anton maybe, you know, obviously that wasn't me. Um, but everything else I pretty much had to do. Uh, I think composing music was the hardest. So, um, we're just gonna watch the movie and I'm going to talk about how it, the process of making it. Um, I wanted the intro of the movie to be exactly like, you know, the actual film Zootopia, so I started with that font and the growling. Um, this opening was actually not the original opening. The film was supposed to open with the Gazelle concert, uh, which happens just a little bit later. I had, uh, I had heard that movies had to start in, like, this way to get people pumped, and the beginning of the movie essentially defines what the rest of the movie's gonna be like. And so I kind of felt that would be the case, and so I decided, okay, I want it to be a little more uh, snappy, a little more fun and upbeat. Um, because when you're at the Gazelle concert, it kind of just starts, and I feel like I wanted a little bit more swagger to the beginning. So, yeah, that was the beginning. I also read later that um, only, like, student films begin with an alarm clock going off, so that kind of sucks, but whatever. Um... Here for Nick Wilde, he, he actually undresses, like, he, he has no shirt on at the beginning, and I actually only did that for shippers, or people who are into this type of stuff, and that's not a joke, I'm, that's definitely something I did on purpose. Um, yeah, so, um, this was really hard, I hate doing backgrounds, backgrounds is like the toughest thing to ever do, and so I, I just genuinely don't like it. Um, but, yeah, I tried to do my best. And, uh, yeah, it's Return to Zootopia. There's the logo. The thing was actually supposed to be called... Well, it was never supposed to be called. Um, I announced it as Zootopia 2, and eventually I changed the name, obviously, because this is not the real Zootopia 2. Um, I was thinking of what the name would be, and so I decided, yeah, Return kind of sounds cool, so Return to Zootopia. Um, I was actually inspired by Captain America the Winter Soldier... No, Civil War, to do these, uh, title cards. Um, this is actually the first thing I drew for this movie, that, that, like, uh, zoom out, and it kind of, like, pans down to Hobson Wild. that was the first thing I ever did. Um, I hated voicing Bogo, that, that was really hard, uh, it's speaking like this the entire time, something like that, and, uh, I had to deepen it using Pitch Shifter, uh, that was really tough, but, you know, whatever, um, Anton maybe is fantastic, is Clawhauser, he also voices, uh, Miles Walker, an incredibly talented voice actor, and, uh, yeah, he's amazing. Now, this shot here, specifically, the one I'm, like, really, we're literally at right now, I had to redraw, because there are some scenes in the beginning of the film that I, I didn't really know how to draw the characters very well, because, you know, I just started drawing them. So I decided to, you know, maybe, like, fix up the, uh, the, the drawings a little bit, so that's kind of a new drawing. It's maybe like, maybe half a year after right, I redrew Nikki, that. Um, no, only my mom can call me Nikki. I remember one time I got a I got a review for because I sp had to split the movie into episodes because I wanted it to be a film. It was always meant to be a film. That's why I call it a fan film. But I split it into episodes no, because uh, a friend of mine called Alex and he also voices a character called Officer Lopez. He told me that it would be smart to cut it into episodes to get people, you know, interested and invested. And I keep constantly uploading, and they'll be like, oh my god, the next episode! So, that was actually a great idea, so I'm very, very happy about that. Um, seeing this conversation now, um, I would have done it a little differently. Maybe some lines are a bit... I feel like they could have been a bit more successful. Um, but the goal of the conversation here they have in the car... And uh, it, it kind of does feel like this. It's, it's supposed to be awkward. And I feel like maybe some people don't understand that the fact that these characters kind of sound like kind of unsure about themselves is because it's supposed to be awkward. The goal of the film was supposed to have uh, the blossoming relationship between Nick and Judy. And I wanted to really present that uh, in a very subtle way at the beginning and then have it build little by little. And uh, I mean, not to brag, because I'm really not. I think I did it pretty well. Um, again, not to brag. At least that's what people have told me. Um, again, you know, I, I wrote this when I was, I think, maybe 
17. I had just started being 17 because my birthday is very close at the beginning of the year. So I had just become 17 and I watched Zootopia. And like maybe a month later, I wrote this thing. And so, yeah, it was <laughs> my 17 year old. Uh, intellectual mind coming up with this uh, writing and uh, the first half of the film is pretty much me when I was 17 and maybe the latter half is 17 18 because I rewrote the film heavily because uh the ending of the original film was completely different from how it actually ends even though I can't possibly I really liked doing Nick Wilde's voice I think it was something very fun uh, I actually think if, if I alter my voice just slightly, it actually, my voice in general is kind of just Nick Wilde's voice in this film. Nick Wilde's voice is kind of just my voice, just deeper. Uh, I try to imitate, uh, man, I forget his name. Oh, also this shot is one of my favorite shots on, in the entire film. Um, Jason Bateman. I tried to imitate Jason Bateman, kind of going like this a little bit, but um, it was very hard. Uh... And it eventually kind of morphed into its own thing. So at the beginning, I was kind of just trying to imitate Bateman. And then later, I just kind of started trying to imitate the Nick Wilde that I created. Um, there's a very obvious play fox in the bed. And that is not like a, like a, just a gag. Like the fact that there's a carrot there. That's, that's intentional. And uh, if you're an adult, you'll probably know what that means. So this is very important here. I wanted it to be... In the original con- oh, by the way, the, the voice actor that uh, Nick Wilde's calling, uh, Mr. Bateman, is not only named by Mr. Bate- is not only named after Jason Bateman, but my teacher voiced the character, so he's a great guy and I love him so much. But, um, here, I forget, I lost my trail of thought. Um, oh yeah, I wanted a, in the original concept art of Zootopia, Nick Wilde lives in essentially a drawer, and I thought that was so cool. And uh, it wasn't used in the film, and I decided, okay, I want to use that. But then it's like, but he's an officer, so he should have like a paycheck by now, so he should be able to move out. So I decided that he's trying to move out, but he doesn't have enough money, and, you know, society, I guess, in general, isn't allowing him to, you know, get uh, an apartment, a better apartment. And so, at the end of the film, and you've probably already seen the film at this point, uh, hopefully, don't watch the director's commentary <laughs> for the first thing you do that don't watch the commentary first and then watch the film watch the film and then watch the commentary he, uh, the um at the end of the film nick and judy get together and that's when they both get a better apartment so it's kind of like they get together and now nick has a nicer apartment as well as judy because her, her apartment's kind of shit to be honest now, uh, sorry for cursing. This is probably not an. I mean, it's PG-13, so. Actually, loved writing this. Um, Judy actually does th this thing. She does is actually like illegal. Like she's not supposed to do this. But I wanted it to be like little seeds planted in that you know things that Judy's doing that are not very ethical and that's one of the things that leads up to her leaving the zpd because i mean technically she this is how she gets things done but it's not legally correct so she decides you know what uh forget the zpd i can do this on my own and i think the the main thing i wanted it to be is that she's not defined by her job it's defined by what she wants to do you know it's not a title it's her, you know, and I wanted that to be more important than like, I want to be an officer, you know. Uh, I love this scene. <laughs> I actually really like the, the first like maybe like 10 minutes of the movie. I really like how everything is done. So if you can tell, the, color just, the colors are very unsaturated. They're not very saturated at all. And I wanted to give uh, the city of Zootopia. That's what it's called, right? Zootopia? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that dumb, right? <laughs> I wanted to give the city of Zootopia a very uh, earthy feel and feel it more grounded, make it make it more grounded. So in the actual film Zootopia, it's very colorful and then little by little it gets darker and grimier, but it still kind of maintains its wonder. Here I wanted it to feel really seedy and I wanted it to feel kind of kind of gritty in some parts. So there are certain areas in the film where things are desaturated and it's essentially to make it feel like a real world and not like a fantasy world. Um, at the beginning, uh, you know, in the actual film Zootopia, Judy Hopps enters Zootopia, and she's like, wow, this is like this amazing world, and again, it's like a fantasy world. So now that she's here, and she knows what it is like, it, it kind of ends up being like, you know, it's a normal world, and there are parts that are pretty, and there are parts that are crappy, and uh, that's what I wanted to showcase. Um, 
this was tough to tough to, to to animate, but I really like the cutting back and forth. Um, I think this was uh, this was I think at the big this was actually at the the first script I did. Um, also, in this conversation, there's a there's a there's a nod to a character named Jennifer. That's obviously Jennifer Goodwin who voices uh, Judy Hopps in the film. Um, I only there's a bunch of cameo like random names that are thrown out that are actually people who worked on the film so like byron howard rich moore uh, lee like from lee's donuts that's someone who worked on the film i think um yeah i really like doing that i feel like i've seen that shot somewhere but i thought like that was an original thought but i'm pretty sure that's been done multiple times the jumping through a window um now judy's running and again this was very hard to animate and this is the first time i ever did something that was like the canvas had to be long and I had to like move the canvas. I did all this in Premiere, which is a terrible idea if you're ever gonna animate and stuff. If you're gonna use an Adobe product, like use After Effects or something, don't use Premiere. This is impossible to do in Premiere. I don't know how the hell I, I managed to pull it off, but you know, now learning that, you know, After Effects exists, it's much better. Um, this isn't alluding to anything, the helicopter. Uh, the helicopter was supposed to be at the original draft of the film. It was always there. Um, in the end of the f original version of the film I wrote, Mrs. Shell was the bad guy. And I, th I didn't want to make Miles Walker the bad guy because it felt a little too obvious. But then in the final version that came out, I decided it's not that it's obvious. It's how he becomes a bad guy that's more interesting than, oh, look, it's a twist, you know? I didn't really care for the twist. I really, what I really cared about was the reason why Miles Walker became a, an antagonist and uh, his past. So, yeah, there we go. Lee's Donuts, that's a reference to someone <laughs> who worked on Zootopia. I can't remember their name, but... Uh, I wanted to add them in there because I feel like everyone who worked on the movie is a god. That cut is great. I don't know if I actually... I wrote... I mean, I wrote everything. I don't know which draft this was in because I have like 16 drafts of the story. So here. So Parson and Ferrer are people I know in real life. Um, or at least I used to know. This is in high school, so... That was another cameo from friends of mine. So this is the introduction to Miles Walker, and here I didn't really know how to draw this guy, so it kind of shifts a little bit. Eventually I get the hang of it, but um, I wanted him to be kind of like this mirror image of Judy. Well, in, in a way, kind of being the main antagonist to Nick. And um, I, I wanted it again to be not really, you don't really know who the main character of the film is. It definitely is, it would be Judy, but Nick has a, a much larger role to play in this film than in the original Zootopia film. And, um, yeah, so, Nick, I mean, uh, Miles, when he says that, you know, he grew up on a farm later in the film, you know, he, he was eventually going to be a carrot farmer, I wanted it to mirror Judy and show, like, the difference in upbringing that they have and how important it is parental figures in your life so uh yeah so nick is jealous here because you know he subconsciously knows that he kind of uh likes judy hops here and so he's kind of like Ugh, i hate this guy i hate this guy miles walker you can go suck a you know so that he he hates miles walker at this point um yeah, so one thing I, I just realized is that I used to, I don't do this later in the film, but I used to make the characters kind of slightly distort and go up and down to kind of like imitate that they're breathing. I don't do this later, but this is something I used to do. And it was actually pretty cool, but it, it really, I used to have a, a terrible graphics card, so it slowed my computer down immensely, and that wasn't good. Is there a garbage can around here? Because I might just throw up in it. If you're into Zootopia, you know that the pig character there is copied from um, a original version, like a character from the original film Zootopia that was not used, and I think she just cameoed in like one scene, and that's it. So, yeah, so here, you know, one thing that's the added advantage of, you know, not having to model these characters constantly and have them have different clothes for a 3D animated film is that in 2D you can constantly just change their clothes. Um, and it's not a big deal, so I really loved doing that. Um, Good morning, Nick. Giving them different styles. So, I don't know if anyone noticed. Now, one is the Arrested Development Easter Egg. That is the dead dove do not eat. 
And then the other thing that I don't know if people noticed is that Nick and Judy are wearing the opposite colors that they usually wear. I get this feeling that he might be using a phone that's just... And uh, by this I mean that, you know, Nick is wearing a... It was like a purplish blue and a blue, and Judy's wearing a green. And that's, you know, the exact opposite colors that they usually wear, so... You know, Judy's uniform and then uh, Nick's usual green shirt, which he barely wears in this movie. Thank God, because I wanted him to look a little bit different. And when I did have a job, I didn't get paid. By the way, the tie that Nick has, it's supposed to be the tie he has in the in the first film. I just didn't want to always be drawing the like purple lines that it has, so just just imagine that it is. Now, I actually like this conversation. I think this was in a later draft that I added. I wanted to add a little bit more chemistry and a little more heart into Nick and Judy's situation. And I wanted them to be... I, I wanted them to kind of lean on each other a little bit more. So this was added. And oh my god, those ears, dude. That was like a, like a last minute idea. And it came out kind of weird, but like... When, it, when, I, when I did it the first time, I thought it was this amazing thing that I came up with. So... So, um, you know, Judy still has that carrot backpack and everything. Um, mom and dad. So the mom, Bonnie, is actually a creative multitasker who voices Judy Hopps. It's the same voice actress. Um, and she did a great job <laughs> making it sound like she was a different person. And I just pitch shifted her voice a little lower. And then the dad is... My teacher, who voiced uh, Mr. Bateman, when who was calling uh, Nick on the phone in the previous scene. Now, um, this scene was kind of frustrating because I had to, I wanted to constantly show the change in Judy's expression, and so that meant like multiple drawings. So this was really, really frustrating. It's like, oh god, like my parents are calling me, and now they they care about something completely different from what I care about. So that was something that I really wanted to showcase here. So, the Mother's Day plotline is actually supposed to be gigantically important in the original draft of the film, but in uh, the final draft, it didn't happen. And, and the thing is, what I mean by that is that in the first draft of the film, um, uh, Nick's mom, who I named Marion, was supposed to come up in the film, and I had to delete her entire scene because pacing, and I just, it, it felt really jarring it felt like it didn't have to be there so she's only at the end um and it kind of just leaves at a cliffhanger so i think that was a little more successful than what my original idea was but i do have still have the drawings of her you know showing up and uh i'll tell you later because that's way later so this was very hard to voice act i have to voice mr shell and it's i don't know if it's obvious that i voiced him but it is to me because i voiced him um I don't know at all how the police works, so I don't know if this is actually, like, something that happens, but, um, does it matter 100%? Not really. Plus, you could say if this isn't something that the police actually do, like, just talk randomly to people, you could just say, hey, I mean, this is Utopia, so laws are different, so, whatever. Now, uh, this isn't, whatever, like, an interrogation or whatever is going on, so... I really liked the muted colors that I that I kept putting in this film, and later it kind of gets a little more saturated, but it still kind of keeps its seediness for the most part. Um, also, in the art, I used to use like a watercolor brush to shade the characters, and then I eventually shifted, and then I started just shading them with like a like an air spray, air air paint, like I don't know what it's called, but like one of those brushes, so it's a, it looks a lot smoother by the end of the film than like this weird patchy kind of coloring. So, you know what What the hardest thing for me in this film was? Uh, Nick and Judy's height, and I had to alter Judy's height to be a little taller, and I made Nick a little shorter to have them be a bit more at eye level, because it was something that I just, I didn't want to deal with, and I was like, you know what, let's just shift them a little bit, it doesn't matter, it's a fantasy, and so there are some scenes where she seems obviously a little taller, like I think in the film, the actual film, she hugs Nick and she's at his like, like the middle of his body but in this film she's almost at like his chest so she's definitely a little taller and Nick is a little shorter um yeah so okay in the actual film um I wanted it to be a little bit easier for people to understand so um Bogo here says no 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 you can't you can't join 
this investigation. So Nick and Judy are like, yeah, we're going to investigate it on our own either way. While in the series version, they just, they're, they're told by Bogo, yeah, you sure you can investigate. So, and uh, in the film version, it actually makes more sense because then Bogo, it makes more sense for Bogo to be mad at them. Um, and again, it goes into their kind of rebellious nature, which again leads them to start their investigation firm at the end of the film. So, uh, I really liked drawing this shot, um, but that shot is essentially like copied from a, like a still from the actual film. So there's that, but <laughs> it looks good. Um, this was hard. This was kind of hard. Uh, I wanted to, you know, it was supposed to be Miles Walker's room. And there's supposed to be this gigantic background, and it's supposed to be really beautiful, but at the end of the day, I was like, does it really matter? I don't want to draw so many dumbbells. So I just kept it like this empty room. And, uh, you know, you can see some stuff in the left, but it's mostly just this gigantic, like, punching bag. And honestly, I don't think people actually paid attention too much to that, so... I don't think it's that big of a deal. So, Miles Walker here, I wanted him to be kind of like an antagonist to Nick again. Because, you know, he's supposed to be like wanting to be with Judy, and Nick obviously doesn't want that. So, Miles is like, oh my god, Judy, you're like so hot. Please marry me, you know. And Nick is like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? This guy's weird as hell. So, yeah, that's something I wanted to really accentuate. Uh, I wanted to accentuate that jealousy because usually when someone is jealous of someone else, that puts them into like or overdrive mode, and they decide, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try even harder, especially if it's a like a relationship type thing. Um, so again, this, <laughs> these are my two friends from high school who voiced uh, Lopez and Myrtle, and uh, yeah, so th I mean their voice acting isn't the best. But uh, I'm so happy that I had them on this film. So it kind of means I, I had them, I guess, in my work. And uh, yeah, that's really, I appreciate that. So now uh, there's that Dutch angle, which I like. Um, yeah, this entire conversation, I mean, it was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was annoying to animate because it wasn't the thing I wanted to animate the most. I wanted to get to the next scene already. But uh, I think that's the toughest thing, when you want to animate something, but you have to get through something that's kind of boring to draw first. And uh, yeah, that was this scene for me. Uh, one thing that was kind of tough was having to draw Lopez, because his face is kind of difficult. It was difficult to make him look not like Nick, but at the same time give him lovable eyes, kind of like Nick and Judy, so... It was just a weird mix, and, uh, you know, he has a big nose, too, so. Now, this is something that I had to delete for the TV series, um, and it was because I just hadn't finished editing it. I think it's pretty funny, but, um, you know, I had to, I had to, I had to just get it done, and I didn't have this done, and I, I, I at the time, wanted to have a female voice actress voice the, that mole rat, I don't know what the hell that thing is called, so I decided, you know what? I'll just delete it, but um, I always intended that to be in the film, and uh, yeah, so eventually I just voiced the mole rat, or whatever the hell that thing is called, The you know you know what that thing is, you know, the Mr. Big Animal, I can't remember what it is, and uh, yeah, so I had to voice it. One thing I thought was very successful in the film was getting Nick's sarcastic nature. Um, I, I have to, I just... Like, again, I don't want to, like, you know, be jerking my own horn, um, but I, I feel like I was very successful in at least capturing the spirit of the main two characters, you know. It actually felt like something Nick Wilde would say, at least to me, you know, and so I felt like I, I did a decent job with that. Um, I really liked that shot with Mrs. Shell disappearing. I wanted to do this a bit more abstract type of thing, like... You know, but whatever. So, um, this was this was very fun to do. I like playing with light a lot, um, even though it's very hard, so I don't do it all the time because I want to get things done. But, uh, you know, when the, the shadow is on the person's face um, and they have, like, this outline of light around them, I really like stuff like that. Now, <laughs> during this time, I loved Ed Sheeran, so I had to put Multiply in there. Like, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta put, you gotta put it in there. Um... Yeah, so this part, um, again, I didn't finish. I didn't finish this on time, so I just I had to put the video out there because, you know, I had to put an episode out. 
But um, it was supposed to always be intended in the film, and that's this scene. So Nick kind of just goes down, and he's like, they they have this like a uh, flashback scene, and uh, it's a bit more banter between them. And again, they get close, so it kind of like shows like, oh, they are getting closer to each other, not just like mentally, but physically. So uh, there's that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was pretty pretty cute. Um, to me, but you know, maybe some people are like, yeah, that's cringe. I don't know. I feel like it would be better if I could actually animate the thing, the thing. But um, you know, obviously I had to do it like an animatic because I don't have time, and you know, my resources aren't there. Now I have those resources, so that's why Interstellar Ranger Commands is like looking nicer. But at the moment, this was not really, you know, I didn't. It's not like I could, you know, fully 2D animate a scene and make it actually like comedy timing would be on point. So I did my best. Um, and here in this scene, I wanted it to be very obvious that Nick is a lot smarter than in the previous film. And also, I wanted Nick to be a little bit more like Judy. And I wanted Judy to be a little bit more like Nick. Because I wanted them to kind of have rubbed off on each other. Not in that way. I mean emotionally. So, what that means is that, you know, certain traits that they have, it's like mixed together. So that's why, um, Judy is more cynical in this film. And Nick is a little bit more hopeful in this film and it kind of like switches from the previous film i remember jennifer goodwin once said in an interview that she would like the sequel for it to be um i think it's either like judy nick saves judy no uh judy saves nick in the first film so in, in the sequel she wanted a uh, um nick to save judy or something like that so yeah um and i kind of intended that to be the one of the main points in this uh, in this film so and again in the first film judy saves nick and nick becomes a little more hopeful now here nick saves judy and eventually it's a little less hopeful it's just a little more accepting and more real lifey at least to me i didn't want it to be like this disney whatever i'll talk about it later because we're still really early in the film um so in this scene Nick finds a, you know, sloth, a flash, and uh, there was actually supposed to be a gigantic car chase here, which I cut, and I replaced with a train scene. And the reason why is because cars are very difficult to animate when they are driving, so I decided to change it into a train, and I think this cut makes up for it. Public transportation. So... I really liked drawing this. This was based on a deleted scene from the original Zootopia, which is when Judy is on a train by herself. I kind of copy copied that, uh, the you know, the, the color look, the look of the scene. Make it a little greenish, a little grimy, like actual New York trains, because they suck. So, yeah. I actually love this banter. This is my favorite banter probably from the entire movie. Absolutely love it. It feels very real. I just, I really, I really like how it came out. I don't know. I just really do. Um, the fight scene here was hard. I did not know how I was going to pull it off. Um, eventually I changed like this weird kind of animatic fighting to actual 2D. Cause I was just like, yeah, it kind of looks weird. It kind of looks wonky. So you know what? I'm just going to change it to 2D, but this is how it was at the beginning, which isn't terrible. It gets the point across, but it isn't as impactful as I would have liked it to be. So, uh, yeah, I eventually changed it. Now, here they go on top of the train, and I never had this scene because, you know, I was just, I, I, I couldn't animate it, man. And it's not like I can get the voice actors to constantly redo lines, but the, the purpose of it was that they don't want to endanger the people inside, so they go outside, even while the train is moving. Um, eventually, they'll get to a station, so it'll stop and they'll escape there. Uh, but people were like, why would they go to the roof? That's dangerous. Well, I mean, if they're going to start shooting inside a train, that's way more dangerous. So I don't know. But that was my thinking. I don't know. At the end of the day, it was mostly just for this scene where they fall off the train. And, uh, you know, Flash goes. And then it was this cool scene, which I really liked animating. And it was Run, Judy. Bass drop time. You know, I really liked doing that, so... And now they are in the water. So, that was fun to animate. Um, yeah, if you can call that animating, I don't know if that's really animating. Um, 
and again, you see like all the carnage that happened and it's kind of sad. And again, it's like to reiterate, yeah, you should be happy that they got on the roof, man. Um, now, this is actually a late addition, and I don't think this was even part of the script. Um, this was just added because, you know, again, since I'm doing everything, I just added it. And technically, since I didn't even need Anton maybe to voice Miles Walker, then I just, you know, added it. And it was to showcase that Miles is tormented. Um, so here, Miles' voice, I don't know if you heard it, that's actually my voice. And the reason why is because Anton maybe, at the time, he was a bit um, indisposed. I don't know if that's the right word. He wasn't available, right, to voice uh, characters. The character Anton maybe because of... Uh, this is also fan service. Uh, uh, he wasn't there to voice the character um, because he, he didn't have a mic at the time, so I had to voice him. And so I voiced Miles Walker for the scene, and it kind of sounds like this. His voice is a little weird. Um, when he voices Miles Walker, it's a bit high shifted, so I had to kind of like alter my voice for it. Um, now this voice actor is the voice actor of Blanston, or later in the film, Jack Savage. And uh, I needed someone, and I didn't want to use my voice again, so I decided I'm just going to have him voice that, and I'm very uh, grateful for him. So, that was great. Now, again, I really wanted to showcase how close these two are getting, and because they're... I don't know if you can tell, they're literally shuffling slightly closer to each other, little by little. Um, and, I, and I wanted it to be like, they're definitely emotionally getting closer and physically getting closer. And that gets even more obvious later on in the movie, and eventually, you know, they bang. So Now, there's the, uh, what is this guy called? Timon. <laughs> if you can tell, that's because uh, Timon from Timon and Pumbaa, it's the same animal. But his name is Tim. Um, so he's looking for Mrs. Shell, who is ha just happens to be in the same hospital. Um, I really liked doing this shot because of just the night sky in the back. Um, I could have definitely made it better, but whatever. So again, same voice actor, Blanston. Um, yeah, so. Tim sees this, and he's like, God damn it, can't kill her here. So he goes outside, and this is where we meet our delightful uh, secondary antagonist, uh, who I really... This scene that's going to come is probably one of my favorite scenes from the entire film, and that's because of how genuinely disturbing it is. Like, this would never be in a Disney movie, obviously, um, but I just really liked doing it a lot. And uh, it's this scene, and it feels very uh, crime drama-ish. Um, I loved voicing, uh, I think, what is his name? Damn, I can't, because I, I voiced Healy, and I voiced the, um, you know, this Otter character, but, um, I can't remember this guy's name. Was it Mike? I think his name was Mike. But you know the sheep character, the bad guy here, and, uh, he had to speak like this, kind of like that. Uh, my voice is kind of dead, guys, so I can't really do it, but, um, it was very fun to do this guy, really fun, and it was really fun to do Healy, so it was, that was great. This was just so fun. It was, man, I had a blast doing this fan film, dude. I really did, so I'm very happy about that, but I'm happy that people enjoyed it. That's what I'm happy about. Um, and you know, they're freaking out, and then... I left a little bit of, uh, just no noise. So you could just kind of take in, like, dude, this guy just got shot, man. And, um, again, the, he obviously didn't deserve getting shot, because, you know, nobody deserves getting shot, uh, and, yeah, so, yeah, kind of kind of sucked for him, but... Also, Healy and uh, his partner, the Otter character, are names of the main characters from the film The Nice Guys, and that just goes to show how much I love The Nice Guys. And this is probably one of my favorite, most iconic shots from the film. This is probably one of my most favorite and iconic shots from the film here. Um, yeah. I, you know, thinking back, I, I, this conversation, I feel, you know, again, I, I, this is one of the first things I wrote and this didn't change too much. This is when I was, you know, 17. Um, again, relationships are kind of awkward, they're never smooth, so I wanted it to feel a little awkward. Maybe it's a bit too awkward, I feel I could have written it better, but I still think it's, it gets the point across that, um, 
you know, there's something between them, and, you know, both of them have stuff in their lives that's kind of, like, messed them up. So, yeah, especially Nick here, because he's saying, like, you know, oh, when I was younger, I used to come here and think, and uh, this would have made a lot more sense if I kept Marion, Nick's mom, in the movie. Um, especially when he says, my mom used to tell me to just sit here and think, uh, and listen, and listen to, like, life. And there was going to be a flashback to that. That's what Nick's dad told Nick's mom, and then Nick's mom told that to Nick, and that's where he got it from. Um, but it was cut, so, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, again, it was a little bit too out of nowhere, so I decided I'm just going to cut that storyline out. Now... <laughs> I really do like this conversation, um, m for the most part, and I like, you know, the idea that these two are uh, alone in, in this isolated location, just looking out at the city that they both live in, and I don't know, it's just something very intimate about it, which I kind of like. And of course, there's Spotify, because of Spotify, and uh, yeah, there's a bunch of music here, uh, which I used to covers from on YouTube, and thank you for the covers, whoever voice those covers it's in the credits somewhere so i obviously obviously credited them I'm not gonna be an asshole um but yeah there's that <laughs> thank you i was looking everywhere for that i wanted there to be like this chemistry which is very obviously like oh dude these two just they need a room you know and I wanted to get to that point without it being too extreme um and again it's because uh, again, you know, I'm obviously not a furry, but I wanted it to be, you could see these characters, if you replace them with people, it would still work. And I didn't want, I wanted it to feel very human. And, you know, again, one thing humans have is like, you know, a drive for that. And I wanted that to be apparent because I feel like that's real, you know, and that's what people do. And so I wanted it to be not subtle you know, but not too apparent, so it was this middle ground. You know, obviously the staring is like, oh, dude, she wants to kiss him right now. Very, very obvious. Um, and again, this is for the shippers, but also I do like romance stories, so that's another thing for me. But, um, yeah, at the end of the day, it was just, I wanted the thing to feel real. And uh, for that to happen, there has to be, you know, that chemistry there. And romantic chemistry is not just friends. So I had to add that as well um, to make it feel more grounded and more real. Um, now this scene is definitely inspired by this film called The Begin Again. If you've seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And yes, uh, it was definitely intentional. It's very much like it. And the movie's amazing, so you should definitely check it out. Um, I had to sing for this part. I actually had to sing for this part. And I, I don't know if I... It was very high pitched, and I noticed this because it was like Nick's voice is very low, so for it to be high pitched, it would be weird. But then again, like a bunch of people have low voices, and then when they sing, it's high pitched, so it was like, whatever, dude. Singing is weird. Let's just go with it. Again, here's my love for Ed Sheeran, so it's an Ed Sheeran song. And, uh, yeah, so. This is the shot that was the hardest to draw, and that's why I kept it on screen for so long. Because I had to draw all those goddamn animals in the background. <laughs> and that's really hard, guys. So um, I really hope you appreciate that. Because, Jesus, that was really tough, man. Um, and yeah. I really like this. I wanted them to do something together. And then I was like, what if they just sing together? And then I was like, what if they have, like, this date? And then you have, like, a montage of what they do in between like this the, the music they're singing you know so it, it felt it felt like this weird disney x like real life hybrid because this happens in disney when characters sing together but also it, it feels more i don't want to say real movie but i want to see like like it feels very much like a movie with with actors like this would happen in a movie with actors with real people and not like animated characters so that's something I wanted to convey. Um, again, the film is supposed to feel very uh, real, and that's why the characters' emotions feel a little more realistic and genuine and, you know, obviously more adult. That's the word I've been looking for. I wanted the film to feel adult. I didn't want it to feel very family-friendly, which, again, that's why it's PG-13, man. And um, 
there's some things that I just I wanted to do that I just couldn't get away with with a PG-13, which with a PG rating. Uh, <laughs> they're watching Breaking Bad here, and uh, yeah, you know, they they don't look. It's it's not like uh, they they have fun here in his bedroom, but they don't they don't do anything. Um, that's not the intention of this. They're just having fun in in uh, Judy's uh, room. They 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 didn't do anything. I just want you to to know this because I feel like people. We'll assume things, because, you know, when someone takes another person to their bedroom, it's like, huh, that's a little weird. Uh, so, yeah, but this is supposed to relate back to the beginning where Nick was like, yeah, uh, I should have gone up to Judy in her room, and now he is there, so their relationship has evolved. Um, now, they keep singing. This is a long-ass song, man. One thing I wanted to showcase, and it's just, this is the next scene here, yeah, it's that, um... The animals that are watching, they, they, they're not even, they're, this isn't, like, supposed to be sarcastic. Like, they genuinely think, like, hey, do they like each other? Because that's kind of gross. That's why he says literally nasty. And it's very, very serious. Like, at the end when he says, yep, they like each other, it's not like a, yay, hooray moment. It's a, oh, yeah, they like each other. And that's gross. And that's how people are perceiving this. Um, and I didn't want that to... You know, that's that's not something that people should be rooting for. Um, so, yeah, this is the final thing he says. They do like each other. I voiced the character. And so, uh, yeah, that that's not a good thing. Yep, they like each other. That's not good. And we get back to another Miles flashback. Uh, we get to see how Miles was abused by his dad. Oh, no, that sucks. Uh, you know... Again, <laughs> this is a Disney movie, so it's supposed to imitate a Disney movie. It's not. It, it is. It isn't a Disney movie. So, yeah, that really sucks. Um, yeah. So now, you know, we have. I really actually liked doing that shot. Um, Miles is getting ready for his day. I'm pretty sure there's going to be something in the coming days. Yeah, the homeless fundraiser. So. He's going to be funding, like, a homeless shelter to house the homeless, which is something that people in real life should do, but they don't. They'd rather fund prisons, so. Anyways, back to something that isn't politics. Um, Judy now has her own desk, and Nick is also there, and he's like, hey, I brought some dandelions. And uh, this scene was actually a little bit longer. There's actually a joke in here, which I completely cut, because the pacing was off, and I couldn't have it well paced because of how restrictive the animation was, so I decided to just cut it. And again, the animals here that work with Nick and Judy are like, wow, you two are absolutely disgusting. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> and so, yeah, that, um, it's on purpose that uh, Lopez and Myrtle are watching these two. They don't like Nick and Judy, but just because they don't really like them doesn't mean they don't respect them as people. And that was the difference. That's what I wanted to, to showcase, that... Even though people cannot like each other, they can still respect each other and live in the same environment. And uh, that's something that I wanted to convey in this film. And so, yeah. So again, that's why Judy's like, there's nothing weird about this. Um, I love you, fam. Nick is like, I love you too. So there's that. Uh, yeah, so. This was very fun to, to actually draw. And this, I'm not like exaggerating. Um, there was something very human about just walking in the street and i really liked drawing that so there's that Jeez, man, you need some commitment. Commitment I have. Patience is what I don't have. that's why it didn't work out yeah i just really like i just i just like how it looks it feels very daytimey so i don't know i just i just really i really like the scene i had to make sure in the plot that mrs shell wouldn't obviously be killed because it's not like uh blanston is going to be there all the time so i had to come up with an idea and that was yeah i'm gonna have to have a you know these two take care of um mrs shell off screen i actually really like this drawing this is probably one of my favorite drawings in the, the film Sir, it was my idea. Officer Wilde had nothing to do with it. I, I dragged him along. You two are partners. Also now she also liked this drawing. Um, Why did you bring the, along? the character I hated drawing the most uh, was Bogo. And uh, it's because 
Not only is his face like uber complicated because he has like a bunch of things <laughs> and a, a bunch of different colors, but <sighs> like the character is just kind of like okay. <laughs> so I don't like. I mean, me. I just don't, it's not like I want to draw the same character over and over again. So I was like, God damn, I have to draw Bogo again in the scene because of a different angle. <sighs> So, yeah, that was really not fun, but, yeah, um, yeah, one thing I didn't even talk about, um, Nick has, like, a, his uniform here, he has it tucked in, it's not tucked out, it's very neat and formal, um, Judy's uniform has changed from the first film, it looks a little less, like, superhero-y, it feels a little bit more realistic, so it has, like, you know, the collar, it has the, the, uh, the radio on her chest there um and again you can take off the vest and it just becomes like a normal shirt so yeah that was the goal for her suit now you have my blessing to help solve this case let's figure it out yes chief now this scene and i'm not even joking <laughs> um i i it's like um i wanted to feel very depressing obviously so uh, it had to be kind of like this obscured, like, I wanted Judy to feel lost here, so I actually literally put her in darkness, and yeah, so it's literal, she's literally engulfed in darkness, because she doesn't know what the hell's going on. Um, she knows what she wants, but everyone is essentially against her, so she's kind of in this state of, like, confusion. That's why she's not even sure she should tell her parents about this, so, Yeah. Um, okay, again, so she's engulfed in darkness, so there's that. Um, one thing that, you know, that's very obvious is that she should be holding her, uh, phone to her ear, to her actual ear. And so that's why when I draw her, you know, the phone is a little bit higher to her ear. It's not directly, like, right in the side of her face most of the time. Sometimes I forgot. But, um, I think, uh, if, if it, like, in Zootopia... These characters, just in general, in general, like, phones wouldn't just, they just wouldn't be like that. It'd be different. I feel like phones would be, I don't know, but, again, to make it very simple, it's just like a, like a normal smartphone. And, uh, yeah, I like doing the rain. That was fun. It kind of added to the, to the feel of the scene. And again, it's a little desaturated, so there's that. Now, I wanted the parents to try to be understanding even though they don't accept it and eventually decide that they care more about their daughter so now this is a scene that i instantly knew from the beginning that i wanted to have in the film and that is just these two solving a case they're eating together and it's like this kind of real like oh man we can't even you know just have dinner at home at our homes so we have to do this on the job and we're solving this case and it has to be something we do together uh it just kind of felt i don't know very investigative one of those things that people do and of course they're eating uh chinese food fast fast chinese food so it kind of feels kind of like again real and kind of adult and so i kind of again wanted that to be kind of the feel for the movie um we can't really yeah. identify the suspect because we lost the fur when we fell into the water. So we're kind of in a rut and too creepy looking. I remember that here, you know, I was still young. So I was like, is rut a word? <laughs> is this how you use rut in a sentence? I'm not even joking. Um, I keep saying that. I keep saying I'm not even joking. I need to stop doing that, man. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it's pretty wild. Um, get it? Wild. Zing. So... Uh, this is kind of where they're starting to uncover the secret, you know. They're asking the right questions for the first time. So, yeah, she gets a phone call. <laughs> I really liked drawing that. Wow, he's talking to you a lot, isn't he? I really, I know this movie like the back of my hand, guys. It's not even, like, I'm being serious. So... This is the scene where it was kind of tough to draw, and that is the Rainforest District. And that is because the Rainforest District is really weird. It's very, very kind of like, it, it looks different. It kind of looks like it has like uh, funnels that kind of go in from the rain and like seep into the rivers, and then that will evaporate, I guess, and then just, it's like a cycle. It's really weird. Um, I try to use the concept art from the book to kind of get a feel for the Rainforest District. 
And now this is uh, some some punk who's like looking at Nick and Judy, and she's like, ew, gross, why are they holding hands? And so here it's very important, Judy holds Nick's hand even tighter, okay? Now, uh, they get greeted by Miles Walker. Miles Walker is like, oh, yes, of course, I'm doing this for the homeless. I love them, you know? And uh, very important here. Even though she's in prison, ex-assistant Mayor Bellwether has a lot of influence. So here he says that, you know, the sheep want to kill him. And that's part of his plan at the end, to make it seem like the sheep kind of want him dead. And so when they finally attack the homeless shelter, it'll be like, oh, they attacked the homeless shelter and they killed all these people and they all went feral and savage. And I was left alive and this was an attack by the sheep. So again, it's connected to the sheep. And, uh, you know, they get to do what they want, and then eventually Miles stays. It was a really, really weird plot. Um, I could have simplified it, honestly, but I'm just, I'm getting really, I'm saying one thing and then on screen is another thing, so let me just focus what's on screen right now. So, yeah, Miles is hitting on Judy here, uh, because he wants that, uh, you know, bunny tail, so... He's like, you know, oh, I want, I want to like, you know, uh, sauce you up, I guess. And Judy's like, oh, he, thank you, you know. And it's this awkward conversation. Um, he's trying to give his life story to eventually get to the point that he's trying to make, which is, I want you with me. It's supposed to be very awkward and uh, kind of like troubling for Judy. Meanwhile, Nick is getting attacked, and it's very obvious that, well, later on you'll know, it's obviously because Miles sent this dude. Um, and this is very important, to better, yourself. to better yourself. He doesn't want what was chosen for him to be his future, so he wants to better himself. But that's where his plan, his mindset is different. Like, he wants people to better themselves, but specific people. He kind of gets, like, his, his ideas skewed by his father, thinking, you know, homeless people do nothing. They don't want to better themselves. Meanwhile, people like me who have the capacity to, they they should be able to. Like people, you know, the government helps these homeless people, but they're not helping people like me when I was younger. And it's this weird kind of twisted thing that he's, that makes honestly no sense, and that's why he's wrong. But um, that's how he sees things. He sees things as like, these homeless people aren't bettering themselves, so they shouldn't be helped. Now that little shot was cut for the PG release, the series release of this film, because that was very violent. His arm just got twisted in half, you know? Um, so, yeah. Um, now, Judy, and, you know, again, great voice acting by creative multitasker. She, she's just like, I'm in, I'm in a relationship, don't do this. Um, yeah, Blanson is like, yeah, please, get out of here, dude. Like, I told you to drop this case. Um, yeah, so... Now here's where Miles pretty much uh, goes insane, and this is when uh, Miles is essentially like, oh, you like a fox. <laughs> you didn't know I was speciesist. <laughs> and <laughs> he, uh, he essentially decides, yeah, I'm gonna, I want to beat the crap out of you and, uh, and Nick, uh, if you ever even try, try me, I guess. Um, he eventually threatens uh, to fire both of them. Um, and yeah, this is kind of like the, it kind of relates to, you know, um, essentially racial discrimination and, uh, uh, homophobia. Kind of like this weird, like, oh, people of two different races shouldn't marry, people of two, th the same, um, gender shouldn't marry. Um, stuff like that, so. That kind of viewpoint people have is what Miles has. So again, it is a touch of, uh, social commentary there. And, uh, yeah, so Judy is like, oh, no. Miles is an asshole. So she goes um, pretty much freaked out to Nick, because Nick is like, yeah, well, I almost got killed, but you know what? That wasn't an emotional attack, but Judy gets an emotional attack, and uh, emotional attacks are pretty much worse for both of them. So she's freaking out, because she's understood that she's getting constantly told, what are you doing? Why are you with this dude? He is a different species from you, and Nick is like, what are you talking about? Don't do that. Don't freak out. And uh, eventually getting told by Miles Walker is the last straw, especially because how he threatened her. So he, uh, Nick has to like support Judy uh, in this moment of crisis, essentially. And, um, well, Miles gets on his podium. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for 
gathering here today to not only support my candidacy... I wanted Miles to slowly shift, and I don't know if you noticed this. He starts blue and eventually turns red, like his clothes, because red is evil most of the time. And, you know, just coloring in general, like, oh, red is evil and blue is good. And so his clothes literally start shifting from, like, bluish and, like, maybe, like, light colors to, like, dark and, like, red colors. That was totally on purpose. Um, his final suit in the film is supposed to look like a supervillain suit. And as well as Nick and Judy, their final uh, clothes they wear are supposed to kind of look like uniforms. Um, Judy has this really cool, uh, like, cardigan that's, like, yellow. And Nick has this blue shirt with a white tie. It's supposed to feel very good versus bad. Kind of like, uh, you know, superheroes putting on their uniforms going into battle. Uh, that was definitely on purpose. So, here, Miles pretty much exposes Judy to the world. And that's not good, because he, we already know how the world sees things. Uh, again, kind of like uh, alluding to real-world uh, problems. And, uh, yeah, so Zootopia is pretty progressive, just not in this aspect, so... Yeah, Nick is like, maybe we shouldn't be here. <laughs> so, we cut to this scene in the train. Um, Judy's leaning on the, the glass here. She's, like, crying. Here's important. So, earlier you saw that she was holding on to Nick's hand. Now she's letting go, and it's symbolic, because she's like, I can't be with you anymore, and she's crying. So, yeah, that was obviously on purpose, duh. And um, they're back into the apartment here. And it's a literal flip from the beginning. Now it's like, you know, they both want to be together. Now it's the exact opposite. And uh, she's like... We can't do this. And again, her voice acting is superb. Like, my voice acting doesn't even match to that because she's so excellent. Excellent. And um, I really like that shot. I, I like kind of like that wide. Um, I liked drawing this a lot because drawing crying is tough. Uh, it really is. And her face like slowly gets red, and the colors are desaturated and green and dark, and it's supposed to feel very, very trashy and just kind of sad. So yeah. And they only care about themselves. Listen to me. Yeah. So she did a great job with the voice acting. So I'm really happy about that. And uh, of course Nick is tearing up, but not as much as Judy because Judy's like the one most affected by this, and Nick has to stay strong for her in this situation. Um, and it just, it, it doesn't work. Like, he, he is trying, but nah. Nah, fam. She just really, she's out of here. She's like, I can't deal with this, uh, social pressure. I know a lot of people were like, Judy wouldn't do this. And it's like, yeah, she would. How would she not, do, like, I, I know a lot of people have told me that sometimes the characters feel out of character. I genuinely disagree and the reason why is because i mean even the actual film zootopia she decided to quit her job as an officer because the pressure was too high and she felt bad she felt like she was doing a bad thing and here she's kind of been in a way like persuaded by societal views that she is doing the wrong thing and again she she stops she leaves she drops she quits and uh, she decides, yeah, I'm, I'm done. Sorry, man. And Nick is like, oh, shit. Well, I guess I can't do anything. And so he gets stuck there. And um, that was very much on purpose. Like, I had to obviously think this is what characters will be doing because I have to think the way the characters think. I know in a lot of fan fictions, and they should not be called fan fictions. They should be called, like, fan creations or something that feels less childish um, in people's fan works. They... Okay. decide, you know, to alter these characters' personalities into whatever they want it to be. And I feel like that's wrong. I feel like that's a bit... Unless you specify, like, this is completely different, or, you know, just make up your own characters. But if you're going to use someone's characters, don't, like, you know, like, skew their personalities, because then it's not even the character that the, the creator created. And it's, I feel personally that feel that's a bit insulting. So I tried my best to respect the creator's decisions the creators of nick and judy and make them act somewhat as like similarly as i i could make them to how i feel they would portray them um, i hope that makes sense so mike is here totally chilling because he's a total criminal uh awesome dude 
I keep I keep not saying curse. I, I keep trying to not curse, but then I just accidentally curse, and I just kind of... What even is the point anymore? So, Miles enters, and it's like, boom, why is he here? Obviously, because he's the bad guy, right? So, also, we have a Healy here, and his arm is broken. And we have Tim. And so we see that, yes, these are all the people who are working together secretly. And... Base drop again. This is also one thing to note. Miles can fight. And one of the reasons why I showed him sh uh, punching a punching bag at the beginning is to show, yeah, this guy can defend himself. And again, he just knocked out Healy in like one punch. Again, he can defend himself. And that's again supposed to make him like an actual physical threat in the film. Uh, and it's very obvious that he becomes one. One thing here, I actually drew a gun in this shot. It was supposed to be like one of those uh, shooting shooting guns, you know, whatever. Um, that was in the original film uh, that that sheep, you know, scientist was making. And then I realized Miles says Night Howler flowers, so I had to change what's in the briefcase to flowers. Um, just a little fun note. I love this shot. Also, the lighting is great. Everything after the shot is great. I like how everything is lit here. Yeah. Um, one note. Healy was never meant to be this important in the film. He, this was actually a last-minute addition that Healy decides to help Nick and Judy. And I actually decided, this is brilliant. I actually really like that this happened. Because in the original version, Nick and Judy were just supposed to kind of like stumble upon that Miles was the bad guy. And then in here, it's actually like an arc that uh, Healy goes through. And he decides to help Nick and Judy discover who the bad guy is. And I felt like not only did it make more sense, even though just kind of like a villain, someone tells the heroes what the answer is, but at least it, it happens in a way of like an arc. Like an arc happens, and I'm glad that that's how it ended up. And uh, yeah, here uh, Flash is like, no, don't call me, dude. Like, I literally got hurt because of you, so... <laughs> yeah, so... I, I mean, now they're not friends, uh, which sucks, but... I mean, what do you expect? So, um, ZNN Cameo, because ZNN is the Zootopia News Network, which is uh, an actual website that people go to for uh, fan news and actual news from Disney about Zootopia. So I wanted them to cameo in there. I did it without even telling them. So uh, eventually they saw it, and they were, I think they were like, oh, cool. Um, now, this is the most controversial thing in the entire film. And I know a lot of people were going to be very disappointed in BOGO here. And I did that on purpose. And the reason why is I felt even from the beginning, like even from the first film, it felt like BOGO was only doing things to save his own ass and not because of what's actually correct. And here he does the same thing. He's trying to save his own ass. And does he care about Nick and Judy? Not really. Not really, man. And that's how I personally felt the character was. Does he maybe act out of character? To some people, I guess he does. To me, he doesn't. I feel like that's what his character has always been. And so he decides that, yeah, I mean... And to be honest, Nick and Judy have been breaking the literal rules of being a police officer. So does it make sense that he's kind of firing them? I mean, it kind of does. And again, it's supposed to be kind of like half each other's fault. It's kind of be like half Bogo's fault, half Nick and Judy's fault. And again... Earlier, Bogo tells them, like, you should listen to what other people say, you should ask for help and not antagonize everyone. And that's why Nick eventually asks for Lopez and Myrtle's help. And uh, it's a growth for him, and then eventually at the end of the end, end of the film, it's Bogo's growth as well. Because um, he decides to pardon Nick and Judy, because he, he definitely was being kind of a, kind of a jerk. And again, he eventually becomes... So I'm gonna need you to Walker's look lackey look here. Reminder, please bring her back so, so we yeah. This situation, and I'll take your badges together, as you know, your partners, and partners share the blame. This is like uh, mirroring what he said earlier. I didn't know you had an intimate relationship with the bunny too, Chief. Why? I really like that comeback. <laughs> I really like uh, that, that worry, comeback, man. I don't know. It just came out of nowhere, I think, but. Um, yeah, it just very felt very, very like on on point what he said. So um, this is also added like at the last second because I realized that Clawhauser also has to knows that has to know that Nick and Judy got fired, and eventually he does call Nick and Judy later on in the film to help them. 
Um, again, this is fan service, so yeah. I'm not even joking. Like, I keep saying I'm not even joking, dude. This is, uh, I, like, come on, man. I mean, this, certain audience watches this thing, too, so. Um, Finnick here pretty much helps Nick, but in his own way. And that is by trying to set him up with a fox. And uh, that will lead to probably my favorite scene in the entire film. And that is Nick's dinner with Karen. And people are like, I hate Karen so much. I love Karen, dude. Writing Karen is probably the most fun I've ever had in, like, ever. It was so fun. She is such, such an asshole. It was amazing. I loved doing it. So, yeah. So, here Finnick is like, Nick, uh... Dude, you should just get with this, with this female fox, man. Just do it. Do it. And uh, Nick is like, oh, no, I don't know if I should do that. Uh, and then eventually he does, but off screen. Um, but here he eventually starts talking about how terrible his life has been, not only with, you know, his job, but also, you know, his, his past relationship with his parents and um, everything like that. So, yeah. It didn't feel like it was just space. Maybe this is it for a Nick. She's been gone for days. I also had to voice Finnick, and uh, that was a tough thing to do. And again, this is uh, Nick's home, which is in like the cabinet drawer or whatever the heck, so he's still living there. It's still shitty. You'll never know until you try, Nick. I'm just trying to help. Um, and yeah, she's supposed to be working in the fields and picking up uh, apples. And uh, here is where her parents kind of support her again. And uh, it's because at the end of the day, even though they don't, um, they, they don't, it's not that they don't respect it. It's that they kind of like, they just don't like it. Because, I mean, I guess they just grew up that way. Um, even though they don't like her relationship, they want her to be happy. And they do want her to go back to her job. And that leads to probably one of my favorite lines ever written in this movie which is when Bonnie tells uh, Judy how she feels that you know essentially Judy's out to go and kill herself every day you don't you know you don't know what's going to happen as a cop um yeah here every day because you're doing what you love being a cop but I can't deny that every morning I wake up and I feel scared. No, kidding. yeah. She's terrified every morning. Every morning. There's no stopping her worrying. I sometimes watch the news and I see you. And it's supposed to be okay. kind of like she she she, she doesn't want her to be a cop. I'm like I mean, she's she's worried for her daughter, obviously. And at I'm the end of the day, though, the she wants her daughter to be happy, and that was the goal here. Exactly. And in this scene, actually, Marion was supposed to appear, and she was also supposed to uh, comfort Judy, but it felt more important that Bonnie and uh, Stu right. comfort their daughter. It felt more and intimate like that. Now that you're here, I can't wait for you to go back. Because if there's one thing I want most in this world. Is for my children to be happy. To be happy. Yeah. I can see you're not happy. So, you know, it's very on the nose, but um, I felt like it It was a very successful scene. Now, this is probably my favorite scene in the entire film. One of my favorite scenes. Um, and that was because of how imaginative I had to be with, if this is like a, a restaurant where mice serve everything, then the mice have to serve everything. How are they going to get stuff there? Well, they're going to freaking drop it with a parachute. And now he's holding on to the mice. Yeah, he's like, oh, well, you know, just keep going. And so, um, again, a creative multitasker voiced Karen, who also voices Judy. Um, amazing voice actress. And, God, I made Karen so obnoxious. And it was so fun to write, man. Um, and, again, Finnick is like, oh, I don't, I don't want Judy to know that... Nick is going out with his other uh, fox, but, you know, the, the point at the end is, like, he tells her because, you know, Judy, Judy's very persistent. And then we're back. This is probably my favorite, favorite line. Favorite dialogue here. Well, I've been an officer for six months now. Great job. Love it. 
Um, I've never felt anything like it. You know, you get this uh, this feeling of responsibility on your shoulder. Have you ever shot anyone? Uh, no. No, I haven't. Tased anyone? N no. Accidentally run someone over? Wow, yikes. No. <laughs> wow. Sounds very boring. It's not, but, you know, never... <laughs> very, very fun to, to write that exchange, um, but... Also, the background was very tough to do, because I realized that, oh, I can do the background, so, you know, there's, like, a gigantic uh, tank of fish and stuff. Then I realized, oh, right, there have to be people eating in the background, so I had to draw that in. And also, uh, Nick is wearing a different suit this time, or, like, you know, dr he's dressed differently, he's wearing white, it makes it a little more formal, a little more nice. And, uh, yeah, she, she's an asshole, she's so mean. <laughs> So, it's supposed to be, again, like this slow build to Karen essentially just dropping wine on Nick. And I have to be like, how am I going to do this? And it's because Judy gets mentioned, and then little by little, you have to notice that she doesn't accept Nick and Judy's relationship. And she feels that she's there to save Nick in this kind of obnoxious way. And so, yeah, that was the goal. <laughs> she's such an asshole man yeah right that I'm, i just really loved writing her man um it was something i i can't i think at the at the fr in the first draft i know nick and judy separated but i don't think karen actually existed i know that maybe i think it was um oh so she cuts him off um I remember the first draft, um, Judy gets back, and I think she just wants to talk to Nick, and she apologizes to him. It was, it was simple. But here, I wanted it to add, like, a little, like, a, a more, like, some more layers to it, so. Um, and then Nick just eventually starts getting mad at Karen, and so, and Karen's like, oh, what are you, hey, man, like, I'm, I'm beautiful, what are you talking about? And Nick is like, girl, you're gross, and so. It, it, it starts getting, it starts becoming an altercation. And so, yeah, he, he, he essentially defends Judy, who isn't there. Little, little does he know that Judy is actually kind of nearing the restaurant, and eventually she kind of reaches the restaurant. And so this is something he doesn't know. And he wants to leave here. Again, the mice are still staring at both of them. Um, it, it was really fun to draw the mice, man. And so, eventually, yeah, here, Karen gets up, and she's like, oh, no, 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 no. And so they start really arguing here. Um, I was going to draw the people in the background, like, looking at them, but I was like, I'm too lazy. <laughs> so I didn't draw them. But, um, yeah, here, here is when Nick really loses his temper, so he starts flinging dollar bills, <laughs> and then Karen's like, you know what? Like, they, they, yeah, like, it's almost like they're about to fight each other or something. The mice are freaking out. And then Nick is like, you know what? I'm, I'm done. He's going to leave. And then I wanted it to end in, like, this beautiful crescendo. And, like, how do I end this? And so I'm like, you know what? Why don't, why don't I just throw wine at Nick and mess up his shirt for him to eventually get a new tie and a new, and a new shirt for the climax of the film? And so, yeah, she just, she, she goes off here. And the music also goes Poof. Wow. That was really fun. That was really fun to do. The pacing is, is, is like I think I personally think the pacing is like on point there. That mm. ah, I love that. I love that line, dude. It's great. A great delivery. Um and yeah, Nick is just kind of like stunned here. Like imagine just having to walk home with like wine on your shirt. Man, that's gonna be embarrassing, so and then Judy comes out. I don't know. His wits? His charm? What about his good heart? What about the fact that he's noble enough to not give you the slap to the face that you deserve? Listen up, whoever you are. You are not going to speak to my partner like that. Never again. I also like the fact that even though it's very obvious that Nick is going out with someone else at the moment, she doesn't necessarily get stuck on that. Um... You know, on that, and she just like, listen. Obviously, Nick is defending me, and like, obviously, who wouldn't, you know, try to move on? And uh, it's very respectful. Um, I wanted to keep it like that. So we get to the reconciliation scene. Essentially, this was actually supposed to be um, slightly more spicy um, 
and it was going to end up in Judy's uh, apartment. But then I kind of wanted it to be immediate. Uh, I wanted it to be like right, right outside because I, I, I felt like it was too soon. And so I wanted them to reconcile there first. And so Nick is like, uh, you yeah, know, I'm sorry. Uh, and then he, he tells her about Bogo as well because that's obviously a plot point that's very important. Um, again, Judy's very, very tall here, and the reason why is because I want them both in the same shot, and the shot wouldn't work, and it had to be a wide, so I wanted it to be close. And, uh, again, very important background, the ZPD is here for you. That is obviously not an accident, it is supposed to be very, very <laughs> ironic, and, uh, yeah, it's a bit on the nose, but it is obviously there on purpose, because, you know, they were both failed by the ZPD. And now Nick is like, obviously, Judy's kind of depressed, so he leaves. And then eventually he's like, you know, I, I got I to gotta help her out here. Also, I really like the lighting in this scene. I really dig it. And it's because of the ZPD sign that kind of gives it this red vibe. Um, yeah, so he's like, listen, Judy, I really do care about you. Very, very typical Disney stuff. Um, or at least the idea, like how I feel like a Disney movie would kind of go. And then she just hugs him. Um, she was supposed to hold him in the first draft. And then I realized she should, like, jump into his arms, maybe, to kind of imitate the first film. And then we're back to another Miles Walker flashback. And here is the more... Um, the one that really will help you understand exactly more of what's going on. And so it's like, oh... This is why Miles thinks of this, thinks of the homeless this way, because his father kind of indoctrinated him, this mindset. And so, yeah, he kind of, and then we get this cut, and I really like the cut, and it's, boom. Oh, not there yet. <laughs> oh, also the, the orange, the orange here is supposed to imitate the fire that we don't know about yet, because everything's glowing orange, and it's like, oh, fire. And so Miles is like staring out, and now he's wearing his suit, his fully red suit. Now, Nick uh, went to buy a new shirt. It's the blue shirt. His tie was supposed to be given by Marion, his mom. His mom was supposed to appear in the next scene, and then eventually I just decided not to do it. So he just has a, has a new tie out of nowhere. Must have just bought it later. Um, this scene was cut from the series because at the end of the day, I didn't want it to be like... I actually didn't want them to kiss in the series for some reason. I think it's because I wanted it to be like, they don't have to kiss for you to understand that they care about each other. But eventually, people were like, ah, oh, I wanted them to kiss. And I was like, you know what? Fine, I'll keep it in. So I kept it in. And, uh, yeah, so... You get told that they're gonna have breakfast, and now they have this conversation, which I really like. Which is the car conversation. And it's where Judy kind of has her epiphany moment. Of like, yeah, maybe... Maybe we should maybe leave the ZPD or, or not not necessarily that. Maybe we should just the the world is kind of messed up, and the world won't accept us. So why do we keep trying to really like alter the world in so heavily? Maybe we should try to be who we are, and by small actions we change the world that way. Um, it's a different way of going about things, and it felt a little more realistic. And then, yeah, here. She's kind of cynical now. Uh, a little more like Nick. Well, on the bright side, you don't have to worry about having to help animals in need anymore. We're on our way to being fired. All aboard the firing train. I think we should quit. Yeah? Yeah. Let's not give them the pleasure of firing us. I've always wanted to oh, and this is an important scene here. In style. So Nick is going to say, quitting, quitting in style, style, right? And so this is actually what Judy does at the end, and uh, Nick says, oh, quitting in style. This was actually, I had no idea this was going to come back around at the end, but it did. <laughs> quitting in style. And this is the, this is the point. Her priorities are different. I understand. Yeah. She doesn't have to really say it. You know what I mean? And I think that's the point of the scene. She doesn't have to say it because it's very obvious what's happening. That she feels like maybe ZPD isn't 
the answer she actually wanted the entire time. Because her goal was more to save people rather than, you know, anything else. Also, if you notice, her eyes turned into, like, um, little arrows. Yeah, that's... At this point, I was starting to watch anime, and so you can very, very obviously tell the influence anime had on me. And uh, the, the look of the show starts changing a little bit also because of anime. So you see her eyes, even though she should have eyelids, I decided to not draw with eyelids. And here she has eyelids, so you see, that's what I mean. And then uh, here's Stu, he's going to say something really awkward. And then they, their faces kind of change. Well, I'm guessing the next time we there. visit, we'll be visiting the apartment you two share, right? Stu, <laughs> see, see? You um, Nick's face completely changes into this, like, anime-looking face. And again, that's the influence of anime, man. Um, here's the scene where things get spicy. Officer Hawks, Officer Wild, I, I need your help, please. Hey... What in the hell do you think you're doing here? I said I need your help. Yeah, Mom, so. Dad, get outside. Very, very intense. And so Healy, again, he wasn't supposed to be sorry, part sorry. of the ending at the beginning, oh, but he ended up being one. And uh, I actually think that was probably Please. my smartest decision in this entire film because he's actually a really cool character, um, fleshed out, uh, at least in my opinion. And so... It's like he he decides to go against them because he killed his, they killed his friend, right? And um, it feels a bit more personal for him now. And so I, I wanted to take advantage of that. And so since Healy knows everything, Healy's going to be the answer to, essentially, the film. He is, like, the key, essentially, so... Yeah. What part do you play? I was hired to make sure no one interfered. Oh, also, voicing Healy was really fun because I had to really exaggerate his voice um, and make it sound like Healy and Nick are two different people. And since, obviously, they're going to be interacting a lot of the time together, that means that Healy's voice has to be really distinct. So I had to go and go really high with a Healy's voice, you know, kind of like get really freaky. And, um, yeah. And, um... story, but no evidence. There's... There's nothing. Yeah. Well, I, know I actually really like this this scene. It's not it's interesting. And I like the music. Miles Walker just randomly showed up in Zootopia and we never hear about his past. Nothing. So he's done some shady deals in the past? I heard he killed his family. What? This is where you get to the revelation. And it's not necessarily like, oh man, he killed his family, that's the answer. It's we have to prove that he did. And uh, again, since they're cops, they have they need evidence, right? So, Clawhauser calls Judy, and it's like, this is what's going on. Judy, wait a second. Bo's planning to fire us together if we go back to the ZPD. Even so, that's probably something he's doing out of respect. We're most likely technically already fired and not in the system anymore. We might have these badges, but I think we might not actually be cops anymore. If we're going to solve this case, we can't go to the ZPD. We have to have evidence ready to be shown. There, exactly. That's 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 the entire point of the reason why they need evidence. They need to get it done immediately because obviously Bogo is being controlled by Walker. So they need to find evidence on Walker so that they can tell Bogo. And um, since they have the badges, even though, you know, <laughs> they're not in the system. It's not like if anyone gets shown a badge, they're obviously going to be like, oh, it, it's a cop. So this is what, what uh, Nick does in the public records. Um, he goes and finds uh, the, the worker there and he's like, hey, look, this is my badge. Uh, give me give me stuff. And uh, yeah. Get a hold of any public documents on Miles you see? So this is what he does, even though obviously he's just not going to look, look at the record. So he gets everything, and then uh, he starts finding information here. And so Healy actually starts becoming a bit of an aide. Hi, quick question. Could you give me the public documents of a Liam Margarine? You're welcome. Arson, she's bad. I like the shot. When he was um, and it's weird. It's like a weird shot, Juvie, but I like how it came out. Hey, now, um, I'm at public record, he... I, I'm head to the I actually really like this shot. This cutting between back and forth, the lighting that I chose was this kind of like slightly desaturated blue hue. 
it kind of feels like a different movie here at this point. It feels like more of like what tells us like a like a like a like a. Like a it doesn't feel like a crime drama anymore. It just feels like a drama. Um, again, I wanted the film to have a different and distinct feel um, in multiple aspects of the film. So in one aspect, it's like a like a like a crime drama then it becomes like a romantic drama then it becomes like an investigative like mystery and then later it becomes like a superhero movie and it's like all these different um tones that kind of merge and hopefully i did it successfully hopefully it flows well from plot point to plot point um and then finally judy meets blanston who again is one of the keys of the film one of the reasons why things get uh, discovered um, I love shots like this in movies when two characters are sitting on a bench and they're kind of just looking forward and talking. I just kind of like that stuff, so I decided to have that in the film for no particular reason, just I liked it. Um, and they go into the hospital and then eventually they find uh, Lopez and Myrtle. And, uh, you know, Blanston's going to tell Judy everything, essentially. So, here we go. I like that zoom in. You did what I asked. Good. Were you the guy that texted me? Yes, I am the text message guy. It seems you've been watching over Mrs. Shell. Matthew, uh, who's Thank the voice you. actor for Blanston well, and Jack Savage. Off Blanston slash Jack Savage is fantastic. Um, I really like his voice acting, so <clears throat> very expressive. And then we get to Bogo calling Myrtle and Lopez. They need uh, to go back to the ZPD because... Uh, they got to they got to uh, interrogate Tim Moan, who just got captured. May 1999. So now they're here, and now they're looking through old newspapers, Mark and scum. I really like this conversation. I want to avenge my partner. He was my best friend. And then Nick kind of like starts flashing back. Partner. It's like, do you know how it feels to lose a partner? And then it's like he starts flashing back to what's happened, and the shots match the music. And I felt like that was a successful thing. Too well. Well, what is it? First sample? I forgot to tell you. Yes, we did. It came back a 100% match for a Tim Moan. A there we go. So now Tim Moan has pretty much been uh, detained, right? Because, you know, they, they needed the first sample to uh, find Tim Moan and to, to know who Tim Moan is, and then they eventually found him. So uh, now he's being interrogated, so... That's great class. Nick's gotta go. Hey, listen, I gotta call you back, buddy. I'm a little busy. And first one. So pretty much, I think I'm not. Even, I'm being completely serious. I think the film takes place in real time, so I actually had to go to to like the calendar and check like the year and make sure dates were actually lined up in correct order. Um, just to make sure everything made sense time wise. I'm pretty sure. Now, yeah, they they get sent to the Zootopia Mental Health Hospital or center, whatever it is. Um, here's where things get intense, and here is where we finally get our first look at 2D animation, which I am very very proud of, and uh, it's this part. So, um, Mrs. Shell is obviously Asian. It's very obvious. Um, and so, just from 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 the way she speaks and her like her accent and her eyes, so she bows. She's like, "Please tell me everything that's happened." Tell me everything, everything you know about your attack and its. It's the first time his lips move. You know about Walker, so he is involved in your assault. Dear, my assault is not what. Uh. It's never been important. Yeah. So. <laughs> It keeps cutting back, and the music stays, so it feels like the what, 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 what we're discovering is sort of like starting to pump up, and we're like, we're really getting to the truth now. And so, again, this is the part, whoa, wait, that 2D animation, bro, relax. Um, it was very fun to do that. And it's funny, because there's three characters in this room, and I had to voice all three of them. And I think I did a pretty decent job of, like, distinguishing each voice. And this was also fun to do. So I had to get, like, an image, draw a new one, kind of give it, like, a like a drawing filter, and then place it into the, the background here. And it was tough because, you know, this was all in Premiere, like that. And I had to be in Premiere. And that's really 
frustrating. It's really tough to do in Premiere. If I had After Effects, this wouldn't be a piece. Of, this would be a piece of cake, but in Premiere, it's annoying. And then I drew these shots um, in a different style, and then I, I gave it like a Photoshop filter to make it feel like the past. You know what I mean? So here, Mrs. Shell tells Judy the entire the truth, right? And uh, yeah, we get that little. You see? It's a different different animation style. Drawing style, I mean. And so she she pretty much exposes the truth to Judy. Meanwhile, Nick is also getting the truth. So since both of them now have evidence, both verbal evidence and now um, files, Nick eventually gets the files uh, about Leah Margarine or Miles Walker. Then they finally have enough proof to take him down. Oh, and also, yeah, he's going to execute his plan at the shelter because Miles Walker hates homeless people. Yay! So, yeah, here we go. Blanston. Oh, Brandon. Blanston, yeah. So, I actually like this shot. And also, when music has this, like, tin 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 kind of, like, a tone, I really love that in movies. When it has, like, that tin tin You know, yeah, I just said it. So, it, I really wanted to have that in this film because it feels like it really pumps you up. Um, kind of like the music in uh, The Dark Knight or whatever Batman movie. It has, like, the tin 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 you know? I wanted that to have... I wanted this film to have it because um, it feels like the, the drama is kind of building because of the music. He's going to kill the homeless tonight. This is all terrible. No one knows for sure. All I know is that Mrs. Shell is weak. She's a huge target. Yeah. She needs to be so, Blanston wants to protect Mrs. Shell because it's essentially his fault that Mrs. Shell uh, got hurt because Mrs. Shell divulged all the information to Blanston. And um, she got hurt because of that. And he wishes he could protect her. And he feels bad. So now, you know, it's Judy's job to stop Miles while Blanston feels like he has a responsibility to Mrs. Shell because she essentially got hurt because of him. Because she was, you know, she gave the information to him. Because again, he's from the ZI-6, so. Um, now, this thing where doctors or psychiatrists, whatever, can actually divulge information to the police to a certain extent, that is actually a thing in certain countries. I think in certain other countries, you just it, it's impossible. You can't divulge information and if you do, like you're you're screwed. Like your your license is gone. But in certain countries, if it's really extreme, then you can. So that's kind of like what I guess Zootopia adopts. And so I just decided that was a thing. Um, again, Zootopia is like this international feeling thing. It's not necessarily United States. It's not necessarily United Kingdom. So it's kind of like this mixed thing. And so that gives me leeway uh, for laws. You know. And I promise I will stop it. So now, your koala boy is going to start divulging everything. Because he is a total snitch. <laughs> so, we get this shot of, you know, the farm, and then it's on fire. And then we get, boom, Miles Walker looking at his house, or his barn, whatever the hell, on fire. Why did he change his name to Miles Walker? So again, essentially, Liam Margarine essentially died in in the hospital or wherever he was, um, and he was reborn as Miles Walker. He wanted to remake his life as Miles Walker, but his ideals never changed. So, um, yeah. Exactly. So Liam Margarine and Miles Walker, two different people. And, yeah, he thinks the homeless people are a disease. They're pretty much sucking government funds, I guess. That's what his, uh, his um, thinking is. So, he get, he, Nick wants copies, and then Healy is gone. Healy disappears. Judy, get ready to listen, because I have a lot of info on Walker. Are you sure you want to do this? So we finally get a scene of Mike and Miles together. And so, you know, it's raining and it's all sad and depressing. <laughs> Setting the stage, essentially, for Miles' is a big plan. And here they're basically saying their plan. Uh, the gas, you know, the, the night howler has been turned into a gas. And now it's going to be like framing the sheep. Miles is going to survive the incident, and he's going to be like, oh my god, these sheep attacked all these homeless people. They want to free Bellwether. I don't want anything like this to happen again. So, 
we're going to free Bellwether from prison, and then everyone gets what they want. And, uh, yeah, so... Exactly. Here, that's the key. There's going to be no reporters inside, so there's going to be no proof that Miles actually is the bad guy, which is why he decides to spout off his uh, villain monologue later. And uh, eventually now here we have Lopez and Myrtle interrogating Timon. It's very, very fun to do because uh, I really like interrogation scenes. And also like the character design of Lopez and Myrtle once I figured out what they should look like. You can't stop it now. I forgot I animated oh, no. that. Wild. Excited to get fired, I see. Bogo, listen for a second. You're not gonna get anything from him. Miles Walker is Liam Margarine. When he was 12, 1999, he burned down his farm. By the way, so the latter half of the film, like I said, has been completely rewritten. The original version was that, uh, I think, uh, Mrs. Shell... Something, she hated something about the homeless or something like that. And she wanted to destroy the homeless as well, kind of like similar to Miles' plot. But the film ended with the helicopter. Nick and Judy are like, you know, flying it. And uh, Judy jumps from the helicopter and like onto the car of Mrs. Shell. And they crash into the homeless shelter. Something like that. You know, I can't remember anymore, but... It's, it was really weird. It's far! I need the chopper. And here we go. So, Nick and uh, Nick decides to trust Lopez and Myrtle. I know you two have too. I could use your help. Quiet, wild. So he's finally asking for help. Essentially, he's finally not treating people like, you know, obstacles. Is that rack focus? And so Lopez is like, you know what, Bogo, you are kind of a dick. And so he wants to help uh, Nick here. Thankfully. <laughs> Thankfully, he doesn't uh, fire Lopez and Myrtle here. That makes no sense. Well, that went peachy. Is that good or not? I like this uh, this scene here, this walking down. If this was 2D animated, this would be a really cool scene because both would be like all three of them would be walking down the stairs. Whatever. Uh, I wish this was 3D animated or like 2D animated, but whatever. I did my best on it. Um, so now we get back to the homeless shelter. And here we go. This is the final act of the film. Well, we're already kind of in the final act, but this is the the final action set piece here. And this is where the 2D animation goes crazy. So Miles is like, yeah, everybody. Um, notice that inside, the, the style of shading is different from when it's outside. That was on purpose, by the way. So it's easier to animate uh, when the shadows are like lines like that. <laughs> Excuse me? Everyone's like, what the hell is this guy doing? Why is he laughing like that? This guy's crazy. <laughs> and here we go. This is when Anton finally gets to let loose. His voice acting is probably arguably the best in, in the, the film. He really goes off. And when he goes off, he, he goes off, man. Like his voice acting, I have no idea how he does it. He goes crazy, man. So I'm, I'm really happy that he's on the, the, the film. Um, so he essentially goes off. This is a spiel, and Judy gets captured. I really liked doing cocky, um, evil Miles, because, like, I could distort his face a lot, and that was the most fun I've ever had in, like, anything. And then, eventually, now, so, like I said, he kind of, like, has, like, a costume, like, everyone's kind of suited up, kind of like a superhero, supervillain type thing, because, again, I, I love superhero films. This is, like, his mask. And so now he puts on the mask, and now he's officially transformed into, I don't know, Nega Miles? Like, negative Miles Walker, evil Miles Walker? I don't know. Um, yeah, so. The thing beeps, the thing's color is green when it's, like, working, and it's red when it's not working, so when his uh, helmet cracks, it's gonna turn red. I think, I think that's how he made it. And, uh, yeah, so they're they're on, like... Now they're, you know, going against each other here. I can't exactly say I'm happy to see you. What are you doing here? Coming to die along with the rest of these outcasts? Dying is not on my agenda today. So, I really like this uh, conversation they have. It's kind of like that combating ideologies here. And uh, 
this is a surprise. At the beginning, the, fir the, the later on versions of this, the draft of the script of the whatever, the original script had Finnick being Healy because I wanted it to be like, there was going to be a side plot of Finnick feeling like he wasn't getting enough attention from Nick because Nick was always in his own problems and then eventually he decides to save the day and Nick is like, thank you so much for being a friend of mine. Then eventually I was like, no, that's a dumb plot line. So I decided to make it Healy. And then we get this sick as hell. Boom. And so we get finally the 2D animation. This was super fun to do. Boom. And then he jumps. Uh, she jumps and then Miles grabs her. And then you get the boom, boom, boom. Kind of like anime-ish thing. Again, very, very inspired by anime. So now Nick is like freaking out. He decides to crash the thing. Um, it was very hard to do. Because it had to look kind of like legit. And so, you know the light i had to increase the light so it looks like the the lamp or like the uh, you know whatever the light coming from the helicopter is growing glowing brighter and then i had to add some blur to the helicopter to make it feel like it's shaking and then here finally we get to just traditional 2d animation now here i didn't add shading to the characters because it's hard it's hard to animate and shade at the same time thankfully there's so much like obscurity going on with fire and lighting that you just don't really tell so it's just like, you can't really tell. So it's just like, now it's just a little simpler of the drawings. But since they're animated, you can't really tell. Again, like I just said. And again, since everything is kind of like this weird hue, then it doesn't really matter. And then this is very fun. <laughs> this was After Effects. Now I finally started using After Effects for the final episode. Um, and for the film, it'd be like the final act. And this was very intense, actually. I wanted it to feel like they're straight up, like, one of them is going to die. I wanted the audience to feel like, oh my god, one of them could die. And for some reason, since, like, the beginning of the fan film, people were like, you're going to kill somebody. Who is it? Is Nick going to die or is Judy going to die? I don't know why. I guess people are really excited for, for death, but I wanted it to feel like one of them was going to die. So if it was either Nick, then it's Nick. If it's Judy, then it's Judy. Both of them are in really in perilous situations. And uh, there's some blood here too, which um, by the end of the film, I was like, yeah, I, I just, I want to make this violent. So um, I felt like keeping it at a PG rating really kind of hurt me as a creator. So I just wanted it to be more intense. And so I decided I'm going to make it more intense. So uh, I really like the, the, the fact that the eyes are like freaking moving everywhere. He's eventually just, he's gone crazy now. And so, you know, in, in anime, this happens a lot. I don't, um, this also happens in traditional cartoons, but I always see this in anime. And so, he gets closer to the light. Oh, you see? And uh, Mike eventually just explodes the, the window here. Some green screen there, which I keyed out the green. And finally, boom, we get this shot. So, someone's going to die. This is like the point where you're like, oh... Someone's gonna die, man. And Judy has to has this moment, and then she's like, "Oh, the only way to beat Miles is through his trauma, which is really messed up." But that's the only thing she could think of because she'd rather, you know, save Nick than save Miles. And so, yeah, she has to hit him with that trauma, and then boom! Excellent music by Ethan. Um, he was the one that did. Uh, the train fight music. He only did one track, and I used it for here, as well as the train fight scene. And, uh, yeah, he's excellent. He's excellent. We just need to find Walker. And boom. Walker Back in the rain. If he's not inside, he's, he's gotta be around here somewhere. Maybe we should check over by those bushes. And this is the part where you're like, Nick? oh. So Nick is going to die. So I, I try to play with the emotions of the audience. Like, oh, someone is going to die and it's going to be Nick. I really like the shaky cam, which I was able to figure out in After Effects. Give it a bit of a wiggle. Make it feel like it's handheld. And uh, yeah, I really started going all out with the animation here. So things start moving. Mal start moving. And uh, at a certain point, yeah, like, I didn't want to animate everyone's mouth. So only when I felt like it was very, very necessary that mouths had to move, I did mouth movement. And yeah, we get that rack focus to the gun. 
Again, Anton, maybe his voice acting is excellent. The, doing the rain was very fun. And the thing is, with the rain, then you have to make it seem like characters are wet. So I had to shade it in a way that made it feel like uh, fur was kind of, you know, wet. There are homeless teens with dreams. Uh, one thing that was tough is that since it's raining, then their clothes have to slowly start being see-through. And that isn't a case for Miles because he's wearing, you know, the suit, but it is the case for Nick and Judy because they're just basically just wearing one layer of clothing. Um, and so eventually at the end, I think Nick, you know, like you see like orange through his shirt because, you know, to make it feel like more authentic, like, yep, it is rain, so... Um, yeah, very violent, <laughs> so... This is essentially the the ultimate standoff here. They all think that they are actually providing a service if they help these animals, but they're not. Again, we get to see Miles' viewpoint here, and I really loved doing this scene. It was very fun to try to figure out like what kind of shots I could do to make things not just look like oh wow it's shot reverse shot, cut to different things. So like the eyeball, the gun, the just pan down to Nick again, you know, different expressions at the same time. Easy for you to say, let it go. You have no idea. You've been ruining everything. Everything. I so you see, Anton maybe no is such a brilliant voice actor. I, I can't even like fathom it, honestly. You. You so you yeah, so now we get to that boom stare down. Like this is like the cro the shot reverse shot, but like not really. It's kind of just like profile profile, you know. And, uh, yeah, I, I like shots like that, so. Now, we, here we get Judy is just defeated, so she's starting to cry a little bit. She's steering up, and she's like, yep, I, I can't see a way out of this. And so she's just like, it's done. So there's no way to beat him, and the only way they win is actually because Miles is just not strong enough. He's a weak character. He's mentally disturbed, and he he essentially sees that, you know, no, what he should be, no, you know, his no, his true ideology or his past ideology should be what Judy is. And so when he's about to shoot Judy, he sees himself as when he was younger, when he was innocent. And so he again sees Nick going up and he sees his father because Nick is like, oh, he's Nick's going to beat me up. And then, you know, they hug. Um, this is a last minute addition. Again, Nick was supposed to beat the crap out of Miles here, just punch him down. But I wanted it to be like... That isn't how we should resolve things. I think it should be... We should try to... You know, to understand more. Even if the person is terrible. And so... Eventually, you know... Boom! Gets beaten down, but... I wanted it to feel like... Miles Walker was saved. In a, in a way. You know? And so, you know, Nick is finally, you know, he's done, but he's, he's going to survive. And they finally just look at each other. Lopez comes in with the camera crew. And then finally we get uh, this shot, one of my favorite shots from the film, because it feels very hopeful. And uh, everyone sees this. So everyone that pretty much <laughs> said uh, Nick and Judy are disgusting see this. Uh, even, you know, Bogo. And they, he realizes that damn, like, my, my prejudices, my, my feelings against something were kind of messed up. Really and so this is, I think, the first time in the entire film where there's a very explicit sexual remark. And so, yeah, um, obviously for the shippers out there. And then Bogo comes in, and then this is the part where people are, like, confused. Why would... Nick and Judy reject going back into, you know, the ZPD. And I don't know, like, I feel like people maybe weren't paying attention. But the truth is that the ZPD were kind of limiting Nick and Judy in a way. Um, not to say that Nick and Judy are like vigilantes, but there's, of course, the due process. There's so much, you know, paperwork that has to be done instead of, you know, legitimately attempting to help people that... At least to Judy, it feels like it's more of a limit, and that's why she decides that, no. And I think it's a growth in character, too, because since the beginning, she's like, I want to be a cop, but that shouldn't be, like, someone's life goal, I think, maybe? I, I just feel like 
it's more mature to pretty much choose for yourself and change, you know, how you think and change. Exactly, like you don't. A title doesn't prove who you are, and that's essentially what uh, Judy learns throughout the film, and uh, she decides to to leave. And obviously, Nick follows her because Nick loves Judy, and so he leaves, quitting in style. Quitting in style. And so, Blanston comes out of nowhere. And so this is the big reveal. I actually, I told the Matthew that you were like, listen, you're gonna voice a character that a lot of people love in the Zootopia fandom. So make sure you never reveal this to anyone. So thank God he didn't. This massive reveal that only people who are fans of Zootopia understand. And it's that uh, Jack Savage is, you know, the character that was created by um, Byron Howard and Rich Moore. And uh, eventually the, the plot line shifted for Zootopia, but... I decided to include him. And here's Judy's monologue, right? So Judy's monologue at the beginning was going to be very, very similar to the first films. And then I realized that it was actually, the, the monologue was actually going to change, it was going to was gonna actually end with change starts with you. And then I realized, no, it shouldn't be so much of a copy. And I decided that maybe the lesson in this film is that you should accept the people who accept who you are and you know why should you try it's 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 hard to explain actually the way i phrased it and i don't know how the heck i wrote it in a way that made sense um the the perfect way to explain it is what judy says in the film but it's 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 how you have to take care of yourself and pretty much live life the way you want to instead of focusing so much on what other people think or something like that and uh yeah focus on the people that live on that reality with you um and it sounds like a, did you write this movie like come on like what do you you don't even remember like come on guys it was a long time ago but and uh at the end of the day this is one of the few things that didn't change i think from the original draft i think um because you know the the drawer idea of Nick living and then they both that? finally get an apartment get together appointment. was supposed to be something from the beginning of the film that was supposed to get resolved. And eventually, uh, Judy is approached by Nick's mom, who is Marion, and then boom. Uh-oh, wait a second. It's Mother's Day, there's a fox, it's obviously Nick's mom. Um, this does not mean Judy's pregnant. That does, that's not what this means. It means that Nick's mom decided to come visit Nick. And then, boom, we get that anime ED, boy. <laughs> it's so anime-inspired. It's not even funny. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of like a, it's kind of hilarious, actually. I had to sing this goddamn song, dude. Um, I did my best. I'm obviously not a singer, but, you know, I think the, the track is actually better than me singing, obviously, but it was very fun to do it. And I really liked uh, matching all the visuals to, you know, the ED and everything. And again, it's very anime-inspired, and that was pretty much it. I really liked doing the, the ED a lot, but I really loved, loved doing the film. It was a, an insane process. It was very, very long. It took, like, what, two and a half years, maybe? Two, two and a half years? And um, I learned a lot doing it. I don't regret it at all. It was very, very fun, like I said multiple times already. And I hope you enjoyed watching it, and I hope you are excited for future projects in store from Brown Table. Um, this is less of a Brown Table thing, this is more of a me thing, but I mean, obviously it's on the Brown Table channel, but yeah, thank you for watching. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, that was Return to Zootopia.